Good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, there we go. Now we're recording. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our last edition for, for 2021 of the Real Property Law section, What's Up With Us webinar. I don't know. Some people, I know some people said it's more like a podcast. I don't know what you want to call it. It's a Zoom meeting um, where we try to discuss uh, current cases and current events in real estate law, and we try to bring you an interesting interview, which today, at fortunate, the last moment, we have what I think is going to be a really fascinating interview. Normally, you see me, Neil Kalin, along with Ashley Peterson, but Ashley, I think, is out vacationing today. So um, we have Michael Simkin, who is joining us, taking Ashley's place. So... Welcome, Michael. Good to see you. I see you on the screen. Now I see you on the slide. Welcome. Uh, welcome to What's Up With Us. So this, this should be a very entertaining um, time for us. <laughs> okay. Well, we, you, you have on your screen, you see we're going to talk about three cases. And we just added the last minute. I didn't have a chance to change my slide. But we're also going to be talking about a, a bill that was passed last year, effective January 1st of this year. And Michael's probably gonna take the lead on that one. So even though it's not on the agenda um, slide, well, we do have an actual substantive slide covering that. And so, Michael, are you okay? We're ready for us to just jump right in and start talking about cases? I'm, I'm ready to go. The only thing I might need help with is, um, I might like wanna add a link or something so people can like find the actual statute. Okay, so you could you would do that uh, uh, probably in the chat tab. Okay, I'll do that in the chat. I could do that. That'll work. Okay, great. Good, good, good. All right. I just put mine up. I'm going to get it out of my screen. There we go. So let's start with our first case of the day, which is Almasian versus Flores. And kind of an interesting case. And it's uh, actually a case of first impression. Um, from what I could tell, and you see it was issued out of the appellate division of the Los Angeles Superior Court, which is the biggest superior court in the state of California. So while it is not, it's, it's interesting, I, I belong to the appellate section of the LA County Bar, and there was this whole discussion uh, about a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, about what is the effect of an appellate division written opinion and published opinion. And so it seems to be that, I think probably the best way to describe it is that the appellate division is a senior court to the um, superior courts in that jurisdiction, in that county, but it's still a superior court decision. So coming from the superior court, so it's not quite clear that it has binding effect on superior courts in other counties. Um, I saw mixed, I saw mixed uh, statements about that. But in any event, we think it certainly is going to have a precedential effect in, again, the biggest county in the state of California, which is Los Angeles County. And so, but Neil, I think that those appellate division opinions, like you said, they're binding in say LA County or whatever county it was in. But I think there's a process where the appellate division can ask the court of appeal to um, somehow make it, well, it's still gonna be binding in the, in the, I don't know, we call it jurisdiction or the, you know, the division that it's in, but there is a way to make it more binding if they want to. Well, so if, so maybe, and that's something I'll have to look into later. Thank you for bringing that up, Michael. So if the appellate division has the right to ask the appellate court, right, which would be the second appellate district in California that has jurisdiction over LA Superior Court. And if the appellate court adopts the opinion, then it is binding on all superior courts, all superior courts, support, all superior courts in the state of California, not it would not just be binding in the LA Superior Court. Well, it might still be only binding in in the uh, whatever this I forget the name, whatever the second district if it's Los Angeles. But um, I think there's a way to make it more binding. 
but this is an interesting case. I mean, uh, it, uh, I feel bad for the, you know, what happened to this person. Well, I guess it, you know, you, you left it very vague because the question is, do you feel bad for the plaintiff or do you feel bad for the defendant? And I guess we'll talk about that in just a minute. So let's just do a quick summary of the facts here. And then the issue is there was a recent law that prohibits a landlord from evicting a tenant based upon uh, based upon domestic violence against that tenant. So if, if that was the grounds that the actions resulting from, from domestic violence are the grounds that are being used to evict the tenant, the tenant can assert that as a defense to an unlawful detainer action. And so you see here, I won't go over all of the facts, uh, lot, long facts here, but the, the plaintiff um, tried to evict the defendant and her husband, um, Will Flores, um, for failing to comply with the three-day notice to quit. And what did the notice actually say? It says the eviction was based on maintaining, permitting, or committing a nuisance, specifically alleging that the lessees, the tenants, have engaged in repeated hostile threats toward other tenants in the building, blocking parking access and spaces, damaging the vehicle of other tenants, okay? Um, that they've invited a large number of people, they're loitering, loitering on the property, they've harassed and intimidated other tenants, and there's an allegation about uh, selling drugs that was also in the complaint. The tenant says, well, wait, wait a minute, no, you can't do this because, and actually the tenant did this at, at the very last minute, um, I said, well, wait a minute, I, one of these incidents, I was a victim of domestic abuse. And the, the court said, well, wait a minute, I, the trial court issued a directed verdict for the plaintiff on the domestic violence defense, right, and, and stated their grounds. And then there was the trial, and at trial, the jury found, well, that the actions that were alleged, right, the, that the landlord wanted to evict the tenant for, that those actions existed, those actions were committed, and therefore the eviction could proceed. The tenant appealed the decision. The appellate court actually made a very technical decision and said, we cannot tell from the verdict upon which specific grounds the jury based their decision. And since one of those grounds could have been the actions that were the result of the domestic violence allegation, that would have provided the tenant a valid defense to the unlawful detainer action. And so we cannot tell because they were kind of all lumped together. One of the, one of the ways that the tenant tried to prove the domestic violence defense was providing a police report for one incident, but the tenant was alleging there was multiple incidents. And so there was some question as to whether that was sufficient. Okay. So there's a couple I mean, of takeaways, Neil. Some of the takeaways here. Absolutely. Are the, um, it looks like there's probably a general verdict as opposed to a special verdict. And so the attorneys, if they would have asked for a special verdict, they could have broken out even some of these acts of violence to see if it's caused by the the good tenant or by the bad tenant that was committing the domestic violence. So then the court with its directed verdict somehow looked at the facts that the court knew in his own head or her head and decided, well, I think I know what's going on here. Um, I posted in the chat, the actual code section that's 1161.3. Yep. So it's, it's also good to take a look at that. Um, because you know the point here is, if you have a, a tenant who's causing a nuisance, you know, does the good tenant need to be, you know, suffer for the acts of the domestic abusive tenant? And that's why they have the section. So the one tenant, you know, won't be evicted along, you know, throwing out the good with the bad, I guess. But 
Well, also, the, the, the section also says just because a tenant is a victim of domestic violence does not mean that the tenant cannot be evicted for any other reason. For example, for non-payment of rent or for non-compliance with a notice to, to perform covenant or quit, right? So there could be completely independent grounds. And again, it looked like in this case, they're all sort of lumped together and it was hard to tell which one the jury um, relied upon um, for saying that the acts were committed. And if it were one of the domestic violent acts, then of course the defense would come into play. Okay. So it's it's a very good opinion because you know, for lawyers, it's good to see an opinion where there's a dissent, right? Because that means there was some kind of a disagreement, right? Uh, and you can see just the real brief summary of the dissent down at the bottom of your screen, which is the dissent said, well, wait a minute, but if you look at the allegations in the complaint, the specific allegations had nothing to do with the domestic violence conduct that was going on. It's probably common though, Neil, don't you think in a nuisance action that uh, uh, the tenant that's causing a problem is just making threats you know, to the other tenants? And you can evict someone for a nuisance for you know walking up to a, a neighbor and you know constantly verbally abusing them or something like that. That's a nuisance. Well, that that's correct. One of what I think a lot of this has to do with whether the majority of the dissent who they actually believed, quite honestly, in this particular case, right? Um, I think that that may have had something to do with with the, why there was two different opinions here, but something that I think you know, anyone who's in the landlord tenant field should be aware of is that in this particular case, the neighboring tenant who was the only witness and said they felt intimidated because of the acts of the abuser. And I said, oh my goodness, if that's what's happening here, we really feel threatened by that person. And so that was related to the act of domestic violence. Now, again, that was only one of the allegations, but it, it certainly expands, right? It, it, it certainly, you know, takes a very expansive look at the domestic violence defense of it. And then the other part of this is the landlord and what happens with the landlord. And I, I posted in the chat uh, a citation to the Civil Code 1946.7 that if the say the victim of the spousal abuse or domestic abuse wants to just leave and not be liable for the rent, she can do that, although that leaves the abusive person behind that now the landlord has to do a nuisance eviction, you know, independently against. And, and look, at, look at the, look at 1161.3 carefully, because I, if I remember correctly, there is a distinction about whether the both, uh, both the abuser and the abused are on the lease or whether the abuser is coming from outside. And so anyone who has this as a potential concern, whether on the landlord or the tenant side, you want to look and see what that distinction is and whether that distinction applies to your particular case. Yeah. And to help the tenant out who's being abused, the, the statute even gives a, an outline of a form that they can fill in and provide to the landlord. So a lot of stuff, like I say, that the case makes it fair, very clear that, that, you know, even in the appellate division of the Superior Court, that they believe this is a case of first impression. And so first impression, they're likely to be in first impression, you know, anywhere in the state. So even if not binding elsewhere throughout the state, there's a good chance that this opinion might be influential in other courts throughout the state. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Michael, anything else you want to add here before we move on? Um, no, I think that, that that covers it. Okay. Great. So we're going from, you know, a, a, a very serious, you know, issue. And again, there may be a credibility issue in the previous case we just, we just discussed, but certainly a very serious, you know, issue that that the legislature, you know, felt compelled to act, right, and to and to bring that statute into existence, to something that maybe is is not quite on the same level of concern, 
um, in, in terms of maybe public policy uh, throughout the state. Um, and this is just a straight up insurance case. And so what we have here is, uh, you know, a homeowner's home was destroyed in a wildfire. And, you know, we, we see the date here, 2014, but we've had wildfires, you know, run rampant in the state of California, you know, for the easily for the last, you know, half decade or more, right, since, since 2014. So a not unusual situation, the home was destroyed by fire. The homeowner had insurance. They had an endorsement increasing coverage up to $329,000 for replacement cost as provided certain conditions. But there was a limitation on that $329,000. It could not exceed the amount reasonably necessary to repair or replace the property. Of course, it could not exceed the policy limits, that makes sense, or it could not receive the actual replacement cost. So we have here what it looked like from the opinion an insurance company that at least my impression of it was probably trying to act in good faith. Within one month, the owner was paid the full cash value of the home, right? And then the insurer held on to whatever the difference might be for the replacement cost until when the insurer held on to the difference between the the um, the cash value and the replacement cost based on an estimate that they received, that the insurer received, and held on to that until construction was actually completed. The owner actually thought the estimate was low. The owner got their own estimate, which was substantially higher. And you can see here, it says, the owner's estimate actually exceeds the town payment amount. The home was completed. The insurer paid, right, for the, for the replacement cost. Afterwards, the owner sued the insurer for breach of contract, breach of the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. And the owner's claim, right, so the, the property was rebuilt. Sounds like no out-of-pocket cost to the homeowner who lost their home in the wildfire. But the owner said, well, wait a minute. Your estimate was low. And so when we went with that builder, we only built the house to try to be consistent with that estimate. But had you actually used a higher estimate, we would have gotten a better house rebuilt for us um, as a result of the wildfire. So the owner said, we actually built something less than what we really wanted to have rebuilt after the wild after the wildfire. Okay, the insurer filed for summary judgment. You can see the trial court granted the insurer's motion. The owner appealed. The appellate court says, well, wait a minute, you've got you got this estimate from the insurer. They were not hiding anything from you. You know, if you wanted to get another bid, you could have gotten another bid and you could have presented that to the insurer saying instead of, you know, um, instead of 300,000, you know, you should have been allowed to build up to 329,000 or whatever the actual dollar amounts were. Um, but you didn't present this information until after the fact. And there are limits to the policy. Um, you, you actually got, you look at my last paragraph down there, you got a new home that was bigger than your old home, right? Um, and everybody was paid, so you're, you're not out of pocket. So really, where, where is the complaint coming from here? It's like, Michael, do you think the homeowner was being greedy here? What do you think's going on? <laughs> well, you know, there are certain people who think that insurance can be used as a benefit. And it, it sounds like the policy limit was $329,000. And I'm guessing they spent a little bit more on that and they wanted to get the difference, but they had a time when they could have probably asked the insurance company for specific reasons why they needed to build a slightly different home that might be slightly larger or slightly more expensive than what the um, insurance was, you know, capping out at, but they waited. So I don't know. I, I agree with the appellate division. I agree with the entire, you know, decision. 
Yeah, like I say, it seems to me that, I mean, it's hard to read into these things, but looking at the case, that the homeowner got into his or her mind that they were entitled to something else, right? Even though they got a complete replacement for the home that was turned, that was burned down, that they did not have to put any of their own money into it. Uh, the insurer gave them that cash, you know, with, you know, within a month, the initial portion, right away, the insurer was paying for their rental properties, you know, during whatever the time that was allowed for the rental, for the um, insurance policy. I, I, I could not find, you know, why the homeowner thought they were entitled to something better than, than what they had, you know, than what was burned down. I, I couldn't see that in the body of the case. So it seems to me like it was a right, right decision at the trial level and a good affirmance at the but, uh, level. But isn't it amazing that this case went so far? I mean, don't you think that the homeowner's attorney should have said, mm -hmm. well, this is your contract and maybe we can ask in a nice way why we need to change, you know, have a different contract, have a different uh, bill I just can't believe we'd go that far. Um, I'm always amazed when I look at cases how some of them got that far as well, and I, you know, I question the advice, quite honestly, that the homeowner got in in pursuing this case to such a level. But I, there's something that I tell my clients all the time, <laughs> which is, law is not math or science; it's strategy and psychology. And some people, you know, they, they're trying to see what they can get out of it. There's nothing wrong with that. That's being an advocate. Right. There, there's a framework, though. I mean, especially when there's a contract with a, you know, a cap of $329,000 on it. Well, I'm, I'm hoping, I guess, for the, for the homeowner's sake, <laughs> that, that the homeowner did not have to pay a lot of money to the to their counsel who was representing them in the case and up on appeal. Um, otherwise, it was a big gamble that really did not pay off. Well, I'm pretty sure it's contingency. Nothing wrong with contingency. I yeah. think sometimes, not often, but sometimes. Yeah, right. Well, Michael, I see we have our our guest, our last minute guest, and I'm so glad we have him. I, I see it. it's under the name uh, Leroy McRae, which I think is the assistant for our guest interviewee, which is Paul Fegan. And why don't we change the slide and I'll let you kind of take over from here because I think we have a really fascinating person that our attendees will want to hear about. Yeah. Hi. So, Hi, look, Paul. You there? You can take yourself off I'm here. here. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Well, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me here. Okay. Um, anyway, we were looking for someone interesting to interview. And I've known you for a long time. And I thought that you're amongst the most interesting people I've ever met because you're a lawyer, you've been involved in, been involved in real estate, and you're retired, and now you have a new profession. But I would like people to know um, what made you want to be a lawyer, especially since I believe your background. Um, what sort of work did your 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 parents do? Well, my mother worked for the Department of Motor Vehicles, and my father was a delivery man for milk. He was a milkman deliverer, and I just decided to become an attorney and make more money and have fun. Were you the first person in your family to become a to go to college? Uh, well, I was, I just had one sister. Yes. <laughs> I have it. And your parents, did they go to college? No, none of my, none of my family. Uh, oh no, this was, this was in 1934 when I was born. So, uh, not many people went to college back then. Okay. So you went to what you went to like John Burroughs junior high, I think. And then what LA high school? Yes. All right. I went to Bancroft Junior High, and then uh, UCLA after that. So, 
So after UCLA, why did you choose to go to law school? Um, because everyone said I'm so smart, but I, I didn't really think I was that smart, even though I got almost straight A's. Uh, and I figured I'd give it a try. And uh, I always was fascinated by the law and um, it was just a natural. And then when I was at UCLA, I took a business law class and I got the top grade in the class out of 250 people. And the professor told me that I should do reading of tests the next semester, which I did and made, made money back then. It was, I got like maybe a nickel or a dime for every um, test that I graded, but it was fun and I enjoyed the prestige of being a top student. And I wanted to be a lawyer because I always believed that everyone should obey the law. Okay, so in 1961, you became a lawyer, right? Yes. Okay, so wh what have you seen change between 1961 and, and now? I mean, I know you're retired now as a lawyer, and that's like not has not been part of your daily life for a long time, but what have you seen as the big change? Well, the biggest change is uh, I was famous for throwing parties, and I had a front page article uh, 50 years ago where it's called The Big Life, One Big Party After Another, and um, I enjoyed just the recognition of being a lawyer, and the law has changed one way that there was no such thing as advertisement. You could be disbarred if you tried to put anything in, to get solicit cases. But because I threw parties, everyone knew me as a lawyer. And uh, that was my advertisement, but it wasn't illegal because I was just throwing parties and I had a front page article and. Uh, December 1, 1971, on the front page of the LA Times when everyone back then read the LA Times because there was no internet or anything. And uh -huh. I was, I enjoyed make, I, I used to get 10, 10 calls a day on new, new cases and I would take one myself, which was good. And I'd give others to some of the people that were friends of mine or lawyers. So you also- I have a question for you, if you don't mind, Michael. Sure, go ahead. Um, when you had your first party and you realized, wow, I could get attention for this, <laughs> right? And, and I understand I was reading a little bit about you as well uh, last night, and I saw that you had multiple parties that got a lot of attention. Did you think, hey, I'm going to have this party because I could get some good publicity out of this after, after you had your first maybe one or two? Did that enter your mind? Uh, it was a combination of things. I always liked attention and I figured I'd get more attention if I had parties. I just, I just didn't think about it. I had a nice house with a great view and um, I'd have people come over and I had small parties and then it got bigger and bigger. And then I'd have people like uh, Jimi Hendrix would, would come to my parties and he would sit, just sit around and have fun. And uh, I got many celebrities come to my parties because I'd have, a, I'd have about 300 people every, every Friday night after, after a while. So that there, was a, to go. A, a, there was a good consequential benefit that it helped your law practice, but it sounds like you just liked having parties. Yes, but part of it was getting business too. I liked the notoriety and I liked the uh, money I was making and I was liking, I, I liked helping people. So, uh, well, other than doing law, um, what other did, you also went into the uh, subleasing business and you invented a whole category of um, office suites. Is that yeah. right? That was, yes. I was looking for an, an office because I wanted to have a nice office to work out of inside of my home. And um, I got a couple of bids to rent from a few people, but they were small little law firms, like three or four people, because the big law firms wouldn't, they wouldn't, they, they, were, they would take people who were law review. 
I was not law review, even though I was a top student, I was not law review. And um, I just enjoyed uh, having people around me and I, I rented from someone and they weren't operating this little suite of about six people. And I took it over and uh, then I decided uh, to get a big library because back then there was no internet and West Publishing was the most, the largest uh, seller of uh, books. And the big firms would have, they'd pay $4,000 to have a state and federal library. Whereas the average attorney could only afford $100 a month for the, the, for the books that were his specialty. And I figured if we got 40 people on one floor and everyone paid $100, they'd have a state and federal library like all the big law firms. And I just decided to take a chance. And there was a building coming up in 19, in, in the late uh, set, set, uh, 60s, actually it was uh, 1960, 1967 uh, and almost 1970. And I went to the, Glendale Federal on, on the main corner in Beverly Hills, uh, where rent was 40 cents a foot for a whole floor of 15,000 square feet. Is that and Beverly Drive in Wilshire? Beverly Drive in Wilshire in the, in the, uh, the northwest corner, which is now the Bank of America, the top floor. And they said they wanted 40 cents a foot, but the top floor would be 50 cents a foot but I was already making a lot of money from my personal injury cases and I figured I could do it. And I had a couple of friends that I wanted to join because it was a risk. None of them would take the risk with me. So I had to do it myself. I did it myself and I rented out the, by the time the building was finished in 1970, I was 100% leased. And then the, uh, after the, one of the neighbor and owners saw what I did at, at, across the street, said, oh, I want you to come into my building too. And I said, okay. And before long, I had 200 lost, 200 full-time, floor, full floor, full-time offices in 26 states across the country with 600 people until the market crashed in 1983. So you would provide people with reception service, secretarial service, what, like by the hour, things like that? Yes, I had all kind, had a staff of 600 people. So I had a specialty for everything. All right. So you gave a start to probably a lot of new lawyers. Yes, I had top lawyers. The top lawyers would rent for me. Okay. And then, but now you've kind of transitioned away from worrying about the day-to-day -day grind of lawyers. And now I think you're still making people happy, but you're definitely putting a smile on their face. So tell me about your, your current vocation. Well, I'm 87 years old. And my hands luckily are very good. And I never, I was a gymnast and I was limber and I'm still limber. I can move my fingers. My mother, when she was, in her 60s, she had arthritis and she couldn't, she, she couldn't open her fingers to sew buttons. And I thought I would happen, I would have the same thing. But because I've been doing magic so much, the doctors say, I will never have arthritis in my fingers and my hands are really good. And that's why I'm a great magician. So what made you learn magic? Like when or, or how, did, what, how did you decide to pick it up? If someone um, wants to learn magic, what do you do? Well, I used to give gifts uh, to all my friends at Christmas time, like now it's holiday time. Like for example, I give a calculator that said Figulator. My nickname was Fig. Everyone knew me as Fig. My license plate on my car was Fig and I, they call them Fig parties. And the, my marketing guy said, you should have a deck of cards with, with your picture on there. And I thought it was a little, too much 
and but he talked me into it and I got the cards and then I started giving holiday cards like I I give I give I had like 1500 of these like 1500 uh calculate figurators and then I had 1500 decks of cards that I gave out to my personal friends and someone showed me a little trick and I thought that was cute and someone showed me another trick and then I'd I'd say look here's my two tricks and they'd laugh and they but and then I got better and better started watching other magicians and I said I could do the same thing but better I could see what they did and fortunately I have that skill that I never realized and my hands are so good that I can amaze everyone with my hands. And now I, I've been doing it for uh, 40 years and my hands are, are still good and I can still amaze people. And I'm happy when I make people happy. Yeah. So uh, do you think you could do a trick over the, the Zoom for yes, us? I, yes, I can. So Neil, is there a way that we can find an audience member or... Is there a way to do that, or do we have to do the trick with you? I I don't know how to how to uh, just get a Neil. audience member. I see we have Dennis who you know got in early, and uh, so maybe if Dennis is willing to participate, um, Dennis, because you're not in the general attendee uh, list. If you'd like. Okay. Hi, hi, Dennis. Um, Hello. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about you. Who are you? Well, I've been in practice since 1993. I'm a sole practitioner. I'm housed in Anaheim and still working. All right. Um, great. So, so Paul, do you, uh, why don't you take it from here and see if you and Dennis can do something magical? Dennis, name a card. Okay, two of clubs. Are you, are you right or left-handed? Right. Thank you. Correct. Name another one. Ace of Hearts. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. I've got I couldn't hear you very well. I've got something in my ear. <laughs> yeah, an Ace of Hearts. <laughs> oh, really? You must be a magician. <laughs> I was going to ask you if you belong to the Magic House there in L.A. Uh, I used to go all the time, but when I got on America's Got Talent 11 years ago, I stopped going to the Magic Castle because getting on America's Got Talent show is, was worth millions of dollars <laughs> mentally and, and financially, I, I guess, because I'm a star by being on that show. I was on that show for four and a half minutes, uh, one of the judges' favorites, and on all the advertisement of the show, they'd have me with my cat on my shoulder doing card tricks. And it was so much publicity because they used to play it on all the stations. Watch what's coming up this, this, this next week on America's Got Talent. It was just generally just me. I was just the, the star, but I, I didn't win the million dollars though. <laughs> That's all right. I posted a couple of links in the chat of to your YouTube, and I think one of them has your appearance in there. That's good. All right. So, well, thank you, Paul. It was nice to uh, chat with you. I hope that we can inspire people that there is life after law. Right. Well, thank you. And you are a great attorney. You used to be my attorney when I needed an attorney, Michael. You are the best. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. You're, you're a, very, a very special person. I appreciate you joining us. You're special too. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Thank you All right. Bye. Now disappear. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My last bye. magic trick. Goodbye. <laughs> okay, bye. So, so Paul, I'm I'm so glad. First of all, Michael, that that you that you asked uh, Paul to join us. I mean, I, I think you know everybody was aware of you know I don't know if they're called vegan or Fijian sweets. I mean, everybody was aware, you know, of those. And so he's a real, you know, innovator and created a whole, a whole industry, basically a whole, whole business model. Yeah. Um, and, you know, obviously has led a very full and active life. And as you mentioned, there, there is life beyond, beyond the, the mere practice of law.
Yeah. And uh, I yeah, actually, I rented from him a long time ago, maybe uh, 20 years ago. I rented a, an office from him in Century City. It, it was uh, it was very good. It was very helpful. He gave a lot of people their start. Um, he would work with people if you couldn't afford the rent. He said, it's okay. What can you afford? $500 a month? No problem. He was very generous about that. Well, uh, it's a great interview, and let's kind of end our last 50 minutes. We have another case and another statute, and not too many announcements uh, today at the end of the year. So we're going to move on. And here we have a case of uh, Khan versus Price. And you can see that this case, um, uh, California Court of Appeal case, and it was an interesting case. And, and really, it, it's kind of amazing when you, you read these cases, like we are wondering, you know, why, why was that homeowner involved in the previous case? Why, why did they maintain it? And here you can see where, why the case would, would be maintained, right? So you, you have the cons, they purchased this multi-story home in San Francisco, you know, long time ago, 1976, unbelievable views, right? San Francisco city, cityscape, the Bay, the Golden Gate Bridge, Angel Island, Marin County on a clear day, right? Unbelievable views in this house. And then the downslope property, you know, at one point in time, you know, planted some trees. And I, I can't remember the name of the trees, but obviously they kept growing and growing and growing and got to the point where they obstructed the view um, of the Khan's property. And, you know, the parties tried to mediate the dispute, the mediation failed. Um, the, the neighbor refused to arbitrate. So Khan filed a lawsuit for declaratory and injunctive release, relief to restore their view. And you would see the, the trial court granted judgment in favor of Khan, but we look down to the appellate court decision. We, got, we go to the general rule of law is that there's no common law right to an unobstructed view. So how is it that the trial court you know, initially ruled in favor you know, of the cons? And that's because San Francisco has an ordinance that was adopted in September of 1988 that allowed a homeowner to sue for nuisance for interference with the view. So we get away from the general law, the general common law right that says, you have no right to a view. The lawsuit was brought based upon the specific San Francisco ordinance. There are certain requirements that had to be met. Those requirements were met in this particular case. Okay. And lo, lo and behold, uh, Khan got an award, right? That the neighbor had to remove the trees. Not even a matter of trimming the trees. Right, because I think the court recognized they're just going to keep growing and growing. They had the trees had to be removed entirely. Um, just so you know, I, I threw in the last sentence of that appellate court decision in the first in the first paragraph. The way the San Francisco ordinance is written is you have to be pretty confident if you're bringing a claim for injunctive relief under the ordinance. Um, because if you bring that claim and you lose, guess what? The claimant has to pay not only their own attorney's fees, but the defendant's attorney's fees as well. So I just thought it was an interesting decision against getting away from the general rule because there happened to be a specific statute or a specific ordinance involved here. It makes sense that somebody would be pursuing this given that that view has to have incredible value not just to the cons, but quite honestly to anybody, you know, that would want to buy that property. Um, the last paragraph that you have on the slide just shows that, you know, when you get these kind of really personal cases, easement cases, view cases, you know, they're sort of like family law cases. They're very, very personal. People dig out as much as they can find. And so you see in this case, wow. Um, you know, the downslope neighbor lived in Hong Kong, but they said, well, wait a minute, why, why does Khan care so much? Khan lives in Florida. You know, what's going on here? You know, how could they even take advantage 
of this of this ordinance when it's not their primary residence. Um, and then in what had to be like a really nasty move, right? The downslope neighbor contacted Khan's lender and says, hey, guess what? They're not even an owner occupant anymore. You should you should foreclose because they have an owner occupant loan. So, you know, when you get these personal cases, wow, parties, they, they just go all out. Well, that's the backstory. This is the thing. I get a lot of neighbor cases, okay. but with neighbor cases, this is like the a woman one scorn type of thing. It's like the gloves are off and these things take go off in these directions that they shouldn't go. And it is a job of a lawyer to try to corral, you know, their client, like on both sides of your clients, because like one, I'm curious here in this case, that tree that was growing, how did that tree benefit Mr. Price? Okay, was it for privacy? I mean, this tree, I could see it interrupting like the middle of this gorgeous view and, and Mr. Khan's upset, but what did that particular tree mean to Mr. Price? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I don't think that was answered. I don't think yeah. that's answered in the case. But you're right. Yeah, it it became so personal. Why was it so personal? You know, were they were they trying to protect the privacy of a a swimming pool or something like that, or trying to protect you know so that so that Khan could not see into their bedroom window? I don't know. I don't know what it was. I mean, a hedge. I get hedge cases, but. A tree? I don't see the benefit of like one, even a massive tree. It could be three, four feet wide. I have no idea what this was. A eucalyptus tree or something? But I don't know why. How could it be worth $100,000 or more, you know, litigating this? Uh, I, and you're, you're the litigator. I'm not. So I will defer to your kind of assessment as to what it might have cost but I would not be surprised. And again, I would not be, I'm not surprised that even if, if the fees were that much, when you, can, when you one considers how much value that type of view that you're talking about, this incredible panoramic view must add incredible value to the cons property. Yeah, when I get these cases, one of the things I try to do is to encourage the people to do early mediations because with these neighbor cases, you'd be amazed Sometimes the smallest gesture, because it, okay, look, most lawsuits are over miscommunication. Okay, that, that, that's what I think it is. I mean, you might objectively say, you know, this contract wasn't drafted correctly. Does this mean that or mean that? But usually it's some sort of misunderstanding, some miscommunication. If these people would have had an early mediation, maybe Mr. Khan could have said, well, I can't have this tree here, but I'll tell you what, you want something to cover that, you know, five foot area in your yard because of some something that you don't like there's a pipe that's ugly so you want a tree i'll pay for you to have a hedge i'll put some bushes there i'll pay for it and that would have been so much less stress than this lawsuit i mean i've never with one exception i've never had a client even clients that win a case to say that the lawsuit was worth the personal stress and the cost even if they win okay it's very rare. It's just, it's a negative thing. So neighbor things like this have to be resolved and people need to um, focus upon that because if the client goes through this and spends, and the client thought, Polly thought, Mr. Price thought, well, this ordinance is to benefit him. He's not even living there. You know, what, what, what's the point of this? Well, the, when he spends all this money and he loses or he has a neighbor that is permanently like, I'm going to, call building the safety because he's doing this. Or I'm gonna call the homeowner association because he's doing that. It's gonna be forever. It's just terrible. Yeah, it, it's, it's not a way to live one's life if, if you have to actually live, live with that, that neighbor on a long, long-term basis. Um, but I, I think what you said is so true. And let's say here, for some reason, the mediation failed, but that's really the attorney's job is to write uh, may, maybe Maybe the attorneys were great. Maybe the mediator is great. You know, I don't know, but I think you're right. In a, in a regular case, the attorney really has to emphasize with their clients when they're at the mediation, what's the downside risk of not settling this case? 
you know, what, why, what's the downside risk of not coming to some accommodation um, that, that would satisfy both parties? And again, I, I'm not going to speak to that. I don't know who mediated it. I don't know what the attorneys were advising their clients. But it seems to me that that's a, that should be a primary concern of any attorney representing the client in a neighbor dispute. Yeah. So we're going to get to another area that's commonly disputed about pets. Yep. That's right here, Mike. Take it away. <laughs> All right. So there is a new set of laws that has come up. And I'm going to put something in the chat here if it worked. Did, did it take what I just put in the chat? Uh, give me a minute. I'm going to scroll down. No, I don't see anything there. I'm having a hard time to. Um, there it goes. Okay, you got it. All right. So there's a new law about emotional support animals. And I have had this historically pop up, um, usually a landlord tenant situation, but I've had people call about airplanes and restaurants and different things. But there's a difference between emotional support animals and service animals. The essence that most of us know is a service animal, say for a blind person or someone with a physical disability of, of some kind. But a lot of people have um, you know, different emotional disabilities that can be debilitating too. And the, uh, having a, an animal you know, can help them. This is a type of therapy. And the, the concept is it's not a pet, it's to provide some sort of therapeutic um, benefit. Well, you could probably still Google emotional support animal certification or something like that. And for $19.99, you can find someone in the world that's willing to sign a, doc a letter that says they're a doctor and they have examined the patient and he needs a support animal. It could be a pit bull. It could be a, I mean, people have we've seen in the news a, a turkey or bird or something. But the person that's providing the, the letter is usually not a person that's really treating the person. And the reason they want this is the landlord says there's a no pet clause. And if you have a emotional support animal and you can prove it somehow, you can have the pet, you don't have to pay increased pet deposit. There's a lot of benefits like that. Well, like anything, um, it, it's good for the first one or 1 million times and then it gets abused. And so the legislature came up with some rules and one is this AB 468 about emotional support animals. And it focuses on two main things. One is actually the actual service animal itself or the emotional support animal that it's sold appropriately. There are some vendors that say, you need to use my particular animal. And so it has to do with the, the sale of animals and also has to do with these letters of support. And the main takeaway from this, I think is in, I'm gonna actually give you guys the section. Um, it's health and safety code, 122317. I'm gonna paste it here in the chat. Um, oh, I think I see what happened. I have to make sure I post this to everybody. Well, here's the, uh, this is the code section. And let me actually repost what I started before. Well, the code sections are li listed there. So I'm sure our, our attendees know how to get a code section. Well, let me, let me try to help out here. Um, here, I wrote this out. Everyone should be able to see that. But you can click on the link. And you'll see th th this first code section, which is the health and safety code 122317 um, at SEC. And then the most important part I think here is there's a section that talks about the person providing the emotional support animal certification has to be somebody that's had a client provider relationship for at least 30 days before providing the requested documentation for a emotional support animal. Um, that kind of wipes out these online 1995 places. The other thing that is, is actually, I found out fascinating when I was looking into this, 
is a definition of what is a support animal. And it actually comes up in the penal code. And this section in the health and safety code even makes a reference to the penal code section. And I'll put that here just so it's referenced. Um, and you'll also find that in the civil code. I think it's 54, 54.1 of the civil okay. code. So it, it, it's found in more than one place in California. Place. So, but now I think there's some guidelines here for people um, that they, that, you know, and if you're a landlord, you look at the document. If it is something from a, a year or two or three ago before this law you know, took effect, which it, it takes effect in January, then you might want to ask your tenant for an updated emotional support animal uh, documentation. I'm Michael, I've got a question for you. I'm, I'm looking through, I was looking through the bill and I looked through the bill and I see 122317, 122318 referred to, both referred to dogs. So do you think the bill has any effect on somebody who says, you know, I, I need an emotional support tiger or I need an emotional support alligator? Okay. So yeah, I see that. They have the word dog in several places, but there's one right after that. It's 122319.5. And the uh, 122319.5 says the purposes of this article, the following definitions apply. Emotional support animal means an animal that provides emotional, cognitive, or similar support. So that's kind of open with the word animal. I mean, that's what I, that's what I was thinking. Because I let's take a look real quick. Let's see if it says animal. I know dog was several places. Yeah, that, that was a, and it seems to me right that, that it shouldn't matter what the animal type is, that those same rules should apply. Now, it makes sense for the person who is who is selling the dog or providing the dog, right? Because there are certain rules for, for service dogs that, that apply. And so that makes sense to me. That part of it makes sense to me. Uh, and that's the 122317 portion of the statute. Um, you know, saying there's a difference between an emotional support dog and a service dog or a guide dog or a signal dog. So that's because those those are unique, right? But one two two three one eight is dealing with the healthcare professional part that you had mentioned. I would think that 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 should have been written more broadly, um, to to cover any kind of an animal. And so I, when I took my first glance at it, I was kind of surprised when I saw that it starts off with 122318A, starts off with referring to an emotional support dog. You're right, 122319.5 has a broad definition of emotional support animal in A, but then also has a definition of emotional support dog in B. So I, I guess we'll have to see if courts are gonna give an expansive reading of this statute or not. You know, I'm, I'm going to try to look this up real quick, but I have a feeling there's another section with the more animal in here. And if I look at, let's take a look here. Well, Michael, while you're doing that, because we're, we're at our two o'clock time, so we'll go just a couple minutes over, but I'm just going to go to our next slide. And you'll bring us up to date. Just to remind everybody what's going on at the real property law section. As I say, the end of the year, not a lot going on. You can see we've got some webinars coming up um, in, in early next year, the winter and the early spring of next year. A really interesting series about global commercial leasing that's um, co-produced, not just with the real property law section. So those are kind of interesting. You can always take advantage um, and go to the CLA online catalog, search for real property or real property section and find out the different offerings um, for those that you, know, you may have missed before, 
hey, it's, you know, it's, it's renewal time. So many of you may need to, to get your hours in. So that's a good place to get your hours. And, you know, think April next year, we're gonna try and have a, a good sized group get together. Hopefully that will be allowed. And we're looking at April next year for a wellness retreat, retreat and uh, educational uh, weekend. And again, we're always looking, if you wanna conduct a webinar, um, we're always looking for that. So please contact Nancy. And our e-news, um, our e-bulletin, we're always looking for short articles, not, not the 20, 30 page article for our journal, which are law review type articles, but you wanna summarize a case, you have an interesting issue. We're always looking for short articles to go into our e-news and Michael, you know, what'd you find out about? <laughs> I'm, talking. I'm gonna have to keep researching. Okay. But, uh, so another thing that's new that people should know about is the CLA system where you can belong to more than one section. And it's really easy now. You can pay it, you know, a higher fee, but belong to all the sections for a flat fee. And that way you have online access to not just say real property materials, but the litigation, the probate, um, anything you want, you know. So some people might want to look into that when it's time to renew their um, bar license. Yeah, so, so CLA is experiment, experimenting with different forms of membership. You could do just what you've done you know, in the past when the sections were part of the bar before it split out into the California Lawyers Association where you get one section membership, but there's now kind of a, a, a lower level membership there's the general membership where you can add, you know, sections to it. And as, as Michael just mentioned, there's a new membership type where you have access to all of the sections of material. So something to think about when you get your renewal notice from the state bar. Um, as usual, if anybody has comments, questions, suggestions, they could send it to me and we'll make sure we, we discuss them or bring it up at another What's Up With Us starting next year. You know, I didn't put it down there. Sorry about that. But if you want to send a comment to me, very easy, Neil K, N-E-I-L-K at C-A-R dot O-R-G. Um, all of our past, not all of them, but most of our past What's Up With Us, they're available on YouTube. I have the link there on the screen. And then, hey, we'll see you in January. So I hope everybody has a good holiday season and a happy new year. Michael. You got the last word. <laughs> uh, well, happy holidays. And thank you for letting me uh, assist you with um, today's webinar. It was fun. Yeah, I really appreciate your insight. Thank you very much, Michael. All right. Thanks.